Good morning, friends, and welcome back once again to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. And I do hope you are enjoying these lectures uh, by me. In the previous lecture, we talked about a very significant, very important, very assertive women's voice that was of Tara Patel. And uh, you might have realized how Tara Patel, because of her only work that is single woman, became very famous since her voice was very assertive, very direct, very frank. In this lecture, we are going to take up another important major voice, Menka Sibdashani. Dear friends, after Eunice D'Souza's nine Indian women poets, there have been very few Indian anthologies where these voices have been included. And there are often, as I have been saying, that there are many poets who actually have a lot of spark in them, yet they have not been paid adequate attention by critics and scholars. I am quite hopeful that in the days to come, these poets will also deserve to be mentioned and to be included in some of the upcoming anthologies. So, this talk centers around Menka Sibdasani, who even though being a woman poet, is not confined only to women's question. There are other subjects also discussed. We find in Menika's world a sort of variety apart from her theme of women or women's treatment. We shall also take up some of the poems by Menka Sibdasani, uh, who also like Tara uh, Patel is uh, a poet as well as a journalist. But before that, let us have a look at uh, the background and the bio of Menka Sibdasani. In the previous lecture also, we talked about the four phases of Indian writing in English. And since we are discussing the postmodernist phase, this phase which produced so many, you know, women's voices and especially some of the new voices, fine like Tara Patel, Menka Sibdashani, Eunice D'Souza, because we remember that the first two phases had very few women writers. And then as we progressed, we also came across Kamla Das's fine uh, works. But during that time also, there were some anthologies which also included women poets in the early phases, especially a devoted to women's uh, issues. One such was the Bengal Book of English Verse, the Anthology of Modern Indian Poetry, which was edited by uh, Gabdolin Goodwin. And there were poems by Indian women, which was also edited by Margaret Mankey Call. Fine. The third phase, which uh, mentioned Eunice D'Souza, Silgardlo, Silgardo, and Gauri Despande, majority of them were confessional poets. Though in uh, to be to be very honest, uh, majority of women poets writing in English uh, can be considered in the light of a sort of confession. So they have a sort of autobiographical tone at times, and the notes of confession also uh, can be uh, found in their works. So the fourth phase, which is the contemporary period as we are facing today, has got many strong women voices like. Sibdasani, Patel, uh, Lakshmi Kannan, Meena Kandaswami, uh, Temsula Ao, and Mamang Dai. So, uh, we are going to discuss uh, Menka Sibdashani, uh, who is uh, a poet of the postmodern phase of Indian writing in English. Indian writing in English. Now, these writers who were born after independence, they actually, with independence, they also got a sort of freedom. The freedom of speech, 
they also got their feministic uh, grievances listened to and then what they started not only did they start talking of their own rights but they also started talking of their linguistic expression very independently there can be found a sort of native sensibility and then uh, time and again one can find a sort of irony uh, then uh, um, uh, satiric uh, treatment in many of the poems and the structural uh, um, patriarchal structure of the society uh, is in the background and as we come further we find that the feminist cries were over and now there came to be a different sort of voice and these voices were the voices of the body, the voices of the uh, soul, the voices of existential anguish and many more. So, Menka Sibdasani uh, can be considered to be uh, one of the Bombay poets because he was one of the founding members uh, of uh, Poetry Circle, fine, which was established in 1986 and that is how uh, she came to be uh, associated and she came to be uh, associated with the literary uh, figures of those times uh, out of uh, which uh, many of them like uh, Nisim Ijikil. Uh, got very much influenced by uh, Menka Sibdasani's uh, writings and we can find the sort of challenge that Menka offers in her works. Uh, they actually even though Menka has uh, not been that vociferous and has not been writing so much but yet whatever she has written that actually are uh, having an ocean of gems, an ocean of thoughts. So Men Menka uh, still pursues her career both as a poet and as a journalist. Uh, she had been uh, to work for a year in Hong Kong and uh, her influences of Ezekiel in her poetry and then uh, Rilke, Rainer uh, Maria Rilke can be found in her poems. Uh, she also edited an anthology of Indian poetry uh, for uh, www.bigbridge.org. She has been the coordinator of a global movement of 100,000 poets for change, Menka is still writing. And uh, we can also delve deep uh, in her poetic uh, uh, overs. Uh, she has uh, four collections to her credit and uh, it was in 1990 because in the previous lecture as I had mentioned that 90s saw, saw a new generation of poets who had a lot of commitment towards not only their theme but also towards their craft and it was at this time. Uh, that Menka came up Nirvana at 10 rupees, Nirvana at 10 rupees. If you have a look at uh, Menika's titles, uh, you can find that they are very symbolic, ironic also at times. Then in 2001 came Stet and then in 2015 came Safe House. So, you can find the gaps between uh, her works and then uh, latest, her latest work is Fragile, Fragile which came out in the year 2018. Uh, Menika has been a co-translator of Freedom and Fisher, which is an anthology of Sindhi partition poetry published by Sahitya Academy in 1998. Uh, Menika's uh, poems have also been translated into some other languages namely Marathi, Malayalam and uh, Gujarati. Now uh, we can also have a look at uh, her uh, poetic ventures and what she uh, tells uh, in her poems. For the first time when this Nirvana at 10 rupees came, this became very popular uh, because uh, if we take a note uh, or a comment by uh, Bruce King who says uh, that this Nirvana at 10 rupees was one of a very small number of books published in an edition of 500 under the supervision of Adil Jashawala by Praxis. You all know uh, the name of uh, Adil Jasawala. We also had uh, a talk on Adil Jasawala's world, and Jasawala's uh, uh, home was actually uh, a home to so many poets where there continued to be uh, discussions, fine uh, talks, interviews, uh, and uh, you know, exchanges of poems and all. In Menka Sibdasani's world, we can find a sort of urban poetry and depiction of urban life which has got all sorts of complexities. Uh, we can find in Menka's works uh, the urban filth, power cuts, bugs, human relationships, find uh, the hurry and worry of our city life. Uh, there are times when we can find because Menka had started writing at a very small age when she was a school girl uh, and at that time also she had started you know scribbling uh, poems. 
so there are uh, autobiographical uh, tones uh, also found and uh, many of her poems can be considered to uh, be autobiographical narratives. It is uh, not surprising to see what Bruce King talks about uh, Menka Sibdasani uh, when uh, he comments like, while her poetry alludes to a world of drugs, sex, bad food, broken relationships and sleepless nights, there is also wit, irony, knowingness and a marvelous imagination. Menika is a mature poet and uh, we find that Menika takes a dig, Menika depicts the contemporary uh, situations uh, by clothing them uh, in the web of her worlds with the help of metaphors. At times she becomes very witty, at times uh, we can find how she hides meaning but at the same time uh, she is quite conscious of what actually she wants to say. Sibdasani at times can use vulgar speech as King says, make expressionist and confessional remarks. There are at times, uh, you know, one can find a sort of confessional remark in many of her uh, poems. But a poet is a poet because a poet actually takes the help of a persona. But the poetry is always highly amazed. There are lots of images, fine. So, it is, it is, uh, Menka's world is rich in imagery, clever, surprising, amusing and self-mocking. At times, there are self-denials also. Self-abnegation, just like uh, Keats, we can find a note of self, annihilation at times, uh, which the poet actually tries to yearn from, uh, because uh, the world that the poet actually lives in is not a world uh, to live in. Now, if we can take uh, one of the poems from our very first uh, uh, anthology entitled Nirvana at 10 Rupees, where uh, the poet actually talks about, even though the poet talks about the disappointment and the dejection and in love and then she also finds and then she also writes how when one has been cheated in love, the world actually becomes quite unaffected. It is for the individual self to understand how she or he has been treated. So, let us take the lines of uh, these uh, poems. Uh, the poem begins with, I will not uh, read the complete poem, but I will take up some of the lines because I have some many more poems also to discuss. When you are happy, only cliches come to mind. The sky is blue, grass is green, butterflies are free, butterflies are free. Whenever uh, all of us are young, the world appears to be a very beautiful place. No complexities, there is a freedom, butterflies are free. Then something happens and solitary as a murderer, you twist the knife and stalk the streets, your brain being crushed to powder like the contents of a vial of a smack, nirvana at 10 rupees is cheap. So, the poet actually tries to show how when you come across a situation when you find that the world is not in tune with you, something has happened which you are not going to accept, then there comes thoughts of envy, thoughts of weariness, thoughts of boredom. You at times want to take a stream step and then she says in a very dig like manner, nirvana at 10 rupees is cheap but the sky has a silvery tinge you would rather perceive as grey. The butterflies are pinned heads down, their backs to the like wall like you. So, as we start growing, no? when we are in our youthful days, the world appears to be a very happy place to live in. But with growing times, all our freedoms like the freedom of the butterfly, so, we are, we are just like butterflies, he takes here butterfly as a metaphor. So, the butterflies are pinned heads down, their backs to the wall like you. So, there goes a change. And the psychiatrist says goodbye, leaves you to pay the restaurant bill and do not forget his fees, though he will not ask, the butterfly no longer struggles, so you think all is well. So, here she talks about the helplessness of somebody who actually is in a state of becoming mad and she looks for love, she looks for sympathy, she looks for compassion, she looks 
for something that can actually uh, help her get out of it and the psychiatrist who can be a lover you know. So, the psychiatrist where does the psychiatrist meet not in his clinic fine, but then in a restaurant and and you know to pay the restaurant bill and only the victim pays the bill and the fees you do not forget and then finally you realize it is not fluttering anymore. Finally, you submit yourself because it is dead and you big deal they ripped you apart with a knife with the index finger then they choked the last breath with the handkerchief in your palm. So, how love can be at times a sort of illusion and once you are cheated deceived in love you want to take the extreme step and you want to find ways as to how to recover, but then where you try to find a so sort of remedy and finally, you come to realize no this was not the way and what happens is the last breath with the handkerchief in your palm they choked you and the last three lines are very important you know what happens to somebody in need somebody in crisis somebody is somebody in a predicament somebody in a difficult situation fine and then the world goes agog all the world is well mythic lover the sky is blue at least it looks that color from down here where the fire burns. Now, this fire burns can have different connotations this can be the bodily fire this can be the fire of the funeral, but then the world to the world everything appears to be quite ordinary everything appears to be quite routine all the world is well mythic lover. So, love was simply a sort of myth love was simply a sort of illusion you are actually uh, exploited and then finally you are gone, but then that realization comes too long. So, nirvana at 10 rupees is cheap, but the sky has a silvery tinge you would rather perceive as grey the butterflies are pinned heads down their backs to the wall. So, one poem after another we find uh, that Menka Sibdeshani as a woman poet she actually talks about not only becoming an object not only becoming you know this many times people feel that they are sheltered yet they are unsheltered and they simply become a sort of commodity especially if they are a women they are simply exploited and thrown like anything and one can see the fire still burning and the world still going on well. But then in some of the poems also we can find a sort of alienation we can find a sort of you know how the poet actually tries uh, to see a sort of parallelism a sort of analogy even in the things around her while living life in a solitary apartment living life in a metro city where loneliness alone is waiting and the loneliness can be shared only with the objects of the house because humans are actually yearning for human's companionship a woman is waiting for a man's companionship in a world where there are no companions in a world where there are no true lovers in a world where there are only pretext and pretension in a world where to think of to be reminded of uh, John Kitts where to think of, of to be uh, is full of sorrow where where this is the world where to think of to be full of sorrow where youth grows pale and as the lines go further where youth grows pale palsy shakes a few sad grey leaden eye despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So, in another poem entitled from spring cleaning we can find how when the persona of the poem uh, looks at a hanger you know, looks at a hanger and uh, the persona here actually tries uh, to see a sort of similarity 
and uh, the lines go like this carelessly draped carelessly draped on a hanger i found an arm leaning bonily towards the perfumes in another corner a dislocated knee a dislocated knee see the metaphor did you run away so fast you broke your leg fine so in a well where when you walk you have to understand how do you walk and the poet there is a sort of self interrogation the persona asks a question to herself alone and says did you run away so fast you broke your leg i wish you would wipe that foolish toothless grin off your stupid face you need not be embarrassed about letting me down so when she looks at the hanger she finds a sort of self compassion fine and then you need not be embarrassed about letting me down other men have to and they didn't disintegrate like you so are these uh, actually clothed in a very subtle way but they tell a lot about the love that was broken a failure in love other men have to and they did not disintegrate like you so you actually ran so fast that you broke your leg you know if you run fast there are chances of accident whether it be life whether it be in the house whether it be on the road whether it be in relationships and that is what she says carelessly draped on a hanger so there is a sort of self sympathy a sort of self uh, confession a sort of self compassion rather now one of the very important uh, books entitled uh, fragile which came out in the year 2018 and which some way or the other i managed to get it so this fragile also had some of the poems as the poet herself told me uh, from her earlier collection entitled nirvana at 10 rupees now you might be curious enough to know what actually does fragile mean the word fragile actually means soft needle like ice on the top of lakes and rivers that are too turbulent to fridge now uh, there is a sort of poetic implication here on this word fragile soft needle like ice so there is ice needle like ice on the top of lakes and rivers that are too turbulent to fridge so emotions being coagulated fine on the top of lakes and these emotions have been no a part of the collection entitled fragile where one can find not only the poems of love but also the poems about life the poems about other objects in and around the poet the poems about anxiety the poems about the nothingness the meaninglessness of life and the poem also about the luge ends of life to be bound to be brought together this collection entitled fragile has got 85 poems and the uh, the collection begins with implosion it is actually the name of the poem and it ends with epilogue a crow finds its feet a crow finds its feet again uh very beautifully uh, the poet has uh, tried to clothe or hide her own feelings but through one poem after another in the entire collection the poetess has tried to depict the entirety of man which does not remain always and every now and then still but there are movements the movements which are at times stunted the movements which are at times still the movements which at times wants to break free the movements which wants to uh, burst out there is actually uh, themes of memory loss love desire death religion and tradition and the entire volume you can also find some poems which also depict about the silences about the spaces that a person finds around himself or herself uh there are poems also which reflect the poet's eco-critical concerns 
No, in many of the poems you can find how the poet uh, likens her own horizon to the sky. Uh, the poem, the poet also at times uh, uh, shows how there are cracks, how there are mountains, how the mountains are being broken, how the nature also is receiving lots of impediments because of the power crazy nature of man who wants to win everything in whatever possible way, but then who does think about uh, the destruction of nature at the hands of man. Now, uh, there is one poem which actually I cannot resist my temptation to recite and to uh, discuss with you. Uh, the poem is entitled, Every Woman is an Island. Every Woman is an Island. This may be a reply uh, to the saying, every man or no man is an island. So, here uh, the poetess says, every woman is an island. And when uh, we look at this uh, poem, you will find uh, the sort of philosophy, uh, the sort of everyday routine under which the lady's own identity is sandwiched or suppressed, repressed and the joy simply heaves a cry, fine, a cry for relief to come out of the dungeons of darkness to come out of the four walls where a woman's life is restricted and where as I remember the other day when we were talking about uh, uh, Lakshmi Kannan's one of the poems where she says Rasa Sundari Devi uh, don't erase the akshara on the wall. Let us read this poem as well. Beneath the hubbub of the kitchen, the moment we uh, uh, mention the word kitchen Naturally, we talk about the domesticity that a woman most of the time is confined to. So, beneath the hubbub of the kitchen and the mountain of dishes, so the diurnals, everyday diurnals that they are, are supposed to be busy with, everyday diurnals, my dear friend, no? Every now and then, no? Cooking, washing, cleaning, fine. We have, we are also reminded of the fact, fine? Cook, clean and fit in, no? But now, the lady says, a mountain of dishes is a dark brooding space, fine. You might be thinking that women are thinking about their own identity, but then they simply find their identity and they find their space where only in the kitchen, a brooding space, this is an uninterrupted space where the woman gets some time to think of her own self, to think of her own fate, to, to think of her own everyday duties, where she simply is supposed to provide everyone with the food for thought except the food for thought being denied to herself. A dark brooding space that rises above the sea, where the gulls careen and kites soar unseen. So, imagination. So, even the woman who is actually confined to the four walls of the kitchen, fine. And then, despite being among all the sorts of colors and smells, what she actually imagines of is the kite soaring unseen and the wild wind, wild wind skims along. So, she has her own space also where she can think uninterrupted. Here there is no dominance of people. Here simply there is a space that she has carved for herself or even she has been fated to for herself. This is a space that withstands everything. This space actually stops everything. The waves slowly chipping its silences. And the waves, the waves of emotion, the waves of thought, the waves of you know, choices, the waves of being free, the waves like that of a butterfly, you know, the emotions like that of a butterfly, waves slowly chipping its silences, the chug of the motor boat invading the rocky shores. Is he not becoming day by day a sort of rocking soul? A sort of rigid, rugged soul where all sorts of these emotions meet, where all sorts of these emotions come and they actually uh, get themselves hurt, becoming everyday rigid. The occasional sip, where is that occasional sip? Where comes that movement? Where comes that freedom? Runs aground and should tsunami churn? Now, the last stanza is very painful. 
and here in her own uh, world of imaginations confined by the four walls of the kitchen and by several smells then she supposes if su tsunami should come once in a while why should she not be a part of that tsunami to be swept away uh, with the currents of the tsunami and from the deep devouring everything look at the beauty the musicality deep devouring everything in its wake she will fold herself tuck in the piece of earth and change the contours of her geography can she not get an occasion where if the tsunami comes she may once again take she may once again be swept and when she says she may be swept just like a piece of earth and we are actually you know reminded to there can be references to the sita who goes uh, underground and with the plow then there came sita so why can she debunk why can't she get herself debunked with the currents of tsunami in order to retell herself in order to reformulate her own existence in order to redefine her own self in order to rediscover herself every woman is an island so they remain an island only and all around there are emotions waves all sorts of things but she stands there like an island so how beautiful we can have some more poems and can find uh, the sort of beauty and the benignity and the depth of feelings uh, uh, the, the the sort of authentic meaning uh, that the persona in this poem is actually longing for but then unlike tara patel Menka Sibdasani is not confined only to women's issues. She also thinks about other concerns of life. Of course, there are anxieties, there are isolations, there are longings for love, but then there are also lessons of life where there are things which one unable to settle finally comes across a sort of disillusionment and finds that life is nothing but an empty dream and finally we can find a sort of return and return to what return to emptiness in this return to emptiness the poet may appear to be a bit philosophic the poet may appear to have the notion of the herbertian no philosophy and then the poet says far beyond where bulldozers break the mountains 400 steps up a bare hillside is a sibalingam that bleeds on touch now here the poet actually talks about how we have actually been following up a sort of tradition a tradition of worshiping gods but at the same time with the advance of you know civilization with the new progressive ways of the world what is happening no a, a, a sort of commodification of everything is taking place and in this blind race of progress the bulldozers break the mountains for 400 steps and then there is a god so god appears to be i mean the sibalang sibalingam appears to be now a thing of neglect because humans are striving towards or striving for a sort of progress the world gusage past in a broken pipe some of us fill water from the cracks the poet also uh, in a way brings about the contemporary scenario where everyone if they find a sort of break if they find a sort of crack they want to make hay while the sun shines everyone is waiting for an opportunity everyone is actually trying to find out some ways to get fill water from the cracks i mean water has also become a sort of impossibility because as men we are breaking mountains as men we are in our blind craze for progress and prosperity we are harming our nature and then where from the water can come the water 
and the water here I mean there is a pun here also people are feeling water from the cracks from the cracks also uh, water people are taking. Some of us sit fat stones on rough sod slopes, some of us are suspended in the sky. So, we start thinking there is a sort of philosophical tinge here that while some people are trying to take advantage of the situation, try to take advantage try to take advantage of situation that has been created in a contemporary world. There are also people who actually are very indifferent and they simply look towards the sky. They feel themselves suspended in the sky. There is a return to emptiness. There is a return to emptiness where salt pans breathe tales of long past liberties. Men smoke their pipes, men smoke their pipe dreams silently and women wear rouge like blood in war, trains spurred into stations like lost love. It appears as if we have lost our destinations. We are actually trying to upset our past, the past that we were so proud of. We actually this can also be interpreted in a different way as in the blind race for progress are we really also thinking about the sustainability? Not at all. Perhaps there is a return to emptiness where salt pans breathe tales of long past liberties. Men smoke their pipe dreams silently and women wear rouge like blood in war, rouge like blood in war. See the use of simile here. So, as if they are prepared, fine, prepared for a, a different sort of revolt and then the trains spurt into stations like lost love. I mean the movements, the aims, the destinations appear to be like lost love and then towards the end what the poet says is an eye opener. Out in the distance, I bleed on touch. But why does the stone stay dry? Why when all these things are taking place, how when man is in actually in a fight against nature, why these stones, why these mountains keep mum when we are trying to make when we are trying to destroy all that we were so proud of. So, there is actually a conflict between tradition and talent. There is a, there is a conflict between tradition and modernity. There is actually a tradition, uh, there is actually a class between uh, two sorts of people. One who is always trying to take advantage of the situation and the other who actually becomes very philosophic and appears to see himself as one suspended in the sky on rough sod, rough sod slopes. So, returning to emptiness is a different sort of poem and this can be interpreted in variety of ways. It can be read from the point of view of a sort of ecological study, a sort of eco-critical one. It can also be thought of as a sort of philosophic poem which actually in a way talks about the contemporary scenario where everyone is trying to make hay while the sun shines. We can also find the themes of Seba Dasani's poetry which actually have been disseminated in different forms where Seba Dasani talks about nature. Uh, she also talks about sexuality and the main woman relationships. She is also in, in some of the poems you can find where she talks about human relationships and she also goes back to Indian myth where she talks about Sita. She also talks about our scriptures Ramayana. She also talks about love and marriage and disillusionment and she also talks about the complexities of city life which is full of filth, which is full of power cuts, which is full of bugs, which is full of noises, which is full of silences. Now, let us take a different uh, note 
which I found in the poems of Seba Dashani and this poem is entitled Ramayana Revisited. This is actually a poem which the poet appears to have uh, written uh, while uh, she, she might uh, have watched the Ramayana on the television once upon a time it was uh, very famous and it had actually stirred the minds not only of adults but also of children and then once again uh, we appear to have the feelings of reverence once again for our old deities for our old gods and goddesses and incarnations. So, the poem goes like this the television seeps through the wall like yet another nightmare. Somebody is crying as usual, tomato ketchup oozing past a knife and here something else coagulates beneath my eyelash. Nothing they taught me in the chemistry lab, prepared me for the iodine gas, raging purple as a sin in my gut, some awful cure for a wound that turned to air, Sita garris as a myth lacerates me as she wails on the screen. So, now there is actually a dig at the way knowledge is being garnered, knowledge is being gathered and she talks about how the modern knowledge has told us about all sorts of arms and ammunitions and warfares, but then as a woman I simply think of Sita as a myth and she also relates it to the contemporary situation that what if Sita were in the present day context what could have happened to Sita because in and around uh, the city and wherever she goes because she is a freelance uh, journalist and in her travels she might have come across several situations and she says so much motion trapped in a drawing room. This in this small drawing room, I find a lot of motion drawing room cabinet, I rock on the chair, remain exactly where I am, see Sita get carried away by the demon, then it is time for lunch. So, now there is another dig that why do we talk about, you know on the one hand we are talking about the scriptures, we are talking about the sacredness, we are talking about uh, the uh, we are talking about the sanctimoniousness and at the same time we find Sita being carried away by the demon. So, in our scriptures also we had this, but the poet compares it to the present day world order to the present day situation and then it is lunch time, it is lunch time. So, Sita you know uh, there was a time when there were several episodes. And I think uh, on that day when Sita was carried away by the demon, it was at that time that it was actually the time for the lunch. And then again she continues, later the news comes on. Look at now, suddenly the poet from uh, this scripture comes out and uh, she has a look at the television and the news and says, later the news comes on, the child emaciated is no longer even a headline. The reader turns to the latest cricket score, how suddenly you know the events, the movements, the consequences, the happenings of the world, fine. The child emaciated is no longer even a headline, but suddenly you know there is a change and then there is a sort of revelry, why? Because the reader turns to the latest cricket score a bomb explodes inside my womb, but I survive till Sunday comes again. There is a question because you know uh, Sita being carried away by the demon and I was thinking of what will happen now, but I will have to wait for, uh, wait till Sunday time for Sita to creep back through the wall. Time for Sita to creep back through the wall, I slide the week behind me like grime or rather like a snake sets its skin, swallow my past like a rabbit hole undigested and it sows somewhere in the middle of my coil. I want to stick my fangs into Sita, but she vanishes just as I strike. So, my curiosity and on the one hand I see Sita no, who was a deity 
and Sita was taken away by the demon and then I look at this world, how the world I mean she actually tries to create a sort of analogy and then she says Sita being carried away by the demon but then the world is all you know full of rejoicing and even the reader actually talks about the cricket news and my curiosity continues and you know I think of all the present day mishaps that is taking place in the world and then I want to stick my fangs into Sita like Sita I have coiled you know somewhere in the middle of my coil I want to stick my fangs into Sita. Why did Sita not revolt? Sita is a myth, fine. Sita is the question that requires so many answers. I want to stick my fangs into Sita, but she vanishes just as I strike. And the poet leaves the uh, poem open for all sorts of interpretations. But then through her poems, the poet actually wants to say that a lady or a woman can also be an iron woman and in this poem when she talks about because every now and then she has been talking about uh, the flaming fire fine the flaming fire uh, there is actually a jill there is a strength and in this poem entitled iron woman she says woman of iron I mean she talks about the potence the power and then she says perhaps you do not know my limitations perhaps you do not understand my worth perhaps you do not know my flexibility perhaps you do not understand my usefulness perhaps you do not understand my significance I can expand however hard you hammer me out I can stand I can expand myself so let us read the lines of the poem so that you can yourself uh, try to find out the meaning woman of iron from an exploded star I embed myself in a crusty earth that waits for the sun to rise. My moment will come in meteors and mud as I lie unseen. How long can I remain cold? How long can I remain under this crusty earth? While the globe revolves, you may burn me and blast me. The furnace of fire yet only free me from compounds that bind. There will come a time when you will free me from your bonds. Fine. From the sort of prison house that you have created around me. And then she says, hammer me into seats. I am malleable too. You have not seen my malleability. You have not seen my flexibility. You have not seen my quality of expansion. I will turn into a plow and shake the earth. Once again like Sita, I will come out of it. Whatever you do, fine. If you really want to relegate me to the backyards, or if you really want to burn me, fine. So the poet has got so many questions. And the poet actually takes uh, the weapon of a poem and says that I am an iron woman. Hammer me into seats. I am malleable too. I will turn into a plow and shake the earth. I have that power. So why do you negate my power? Why do you underestimate my power? And then she says, stretch me into wires and ductile and delicate. I will light up. Look at the words. Light up the world in return. Have you seen the sort of rays? Have you seen the sort of light that I possess? I can stretch without breaking. I can stretch without breaking. For I have been through the blade, freed from the meteorite with lightening tongue. You may melt me and mix me. I emerge even purer, magnetic and ready to strike iron woman in her element. Perhaps you do not understand within my layers how power lies. What a sort of power is there within me. You actually have to, whatever you do, despite all sorts of operations, despite all sorts of persecutions bent upon me, I will always come victorious. I will always uh, come triumphant. I will always come as a winner. You perhaps have not realized but that day will come. This is actually a call for a change and this is also a call for people to realize uh, the worth of a woman. There will be a new civilization, there will be a new down on earth. We can 
uh, continue unraveling the joys in the world of uh, Menka Shibdashani, but we can take some characteristic hallmarks uh, of her poetry in a very short way. Devotion and delusionment, they are working uh, in majority of the poems. Uh, I, as I have been saying that uh, Menka had been writing poems uh, since she was a school girl uh, and in those uh, poems uh, one may not find that much of maturity but then that was of a growing poet. But then she says, at 13 I believed in rose petals strewn at the earth God's feet, agarbatti aromas made uh, me heavy. She is also not opposed to uh, the uses of Indian words. And I ate prashad only after a bath, she talks about a tradition. But later on she says when she looks at the world that how when we are child, when we are child we do not know the complexities and the realities of this world. But then later she says, God did not exist, I said I was 18. Once I become young, the world for me will change. I will have to face numerous gadgets that go on dripping me and dripping me, those blazes, fine. Lastly, 22, I no longer worshipped myself for him. I look at the sculptures in the puja room and wonder are the gods finally beginning to smile again. And she also puts a question to this man-made world, man-made God and she says, as I grow 22, I simply look at these sculptures that talk of high ideals and perhaps there is a reference to so many women being actually maltreated at the hands of men and then she says, and I wonder, are the gods finally beginning to smile again? God has become so powerless when all sorts of atrocities are heaped upon women. And then uh, she also talks about love and loss in her diary of a mad house. What Menika writes is uh, actually uh, very important. She says, there is still an emptiness within me where my friend used to rest its head and the lease feels strangely slack except when my new companion tugs at me with the weight of his hand. But of course, my new companion is not quite so faithful to me. He is a vet, you see, and there are so many traumatized creatures baying in this world. He helps me them all for a price naturally, while I, under his expert care, pretend to be perfectly well. So, this is actually, this he talks about uh, the various sorts of love and loss and then how love is not permanent, rather how love changes in this world of today and every changed lover is not the same. Everyone has got his or her own uh, privileges and they have always been able to uh, see uh, that women are treated in a very quite different way and they uh, have been treated as a thing, as a sort of commodity. Uh, Menika also talks about uh, the identity quest or search for identity where in one poem uh, she says in, in her school girl, no more she says, I learned the mechanics of bird flying in biology but did not possess the wings. So she mocks at, there is a sort of self mocking attitude with this poet who says that the lessons that I learnt in my schools and colleges about bird flying in biology, but then I could not take wings. I think freedom uh, was not allowed, choice was not allowed. There is alienation in one poem or the other you will find. I wait alone seeing silence fall on a painted wall, fine. Actually, she has herself admitted in one of her interviews that in the haste and mindset that a digital world implies, there are times when a writer must slow down and that is why Menka uh, does not write so frequently as uh, other writers or other poets. About her uh, poetic craft or creation, she says that a poet should try to observe silence and try to understand uh, the value of silence so that one can hear the sound of one's inner voice. For good poetry, what C says and advises is, in order to write good poetry, one should read good poetry. And C also is in favor of not writing quickly, but let the ideas sink 
let the feelings sink so that they can take a birth in a better way. Having discussed uh, some of the poems of Menka Sibdasani, because my intention here is to familiarize the readers with the beautiful works of Menka Sibdasani. And I think that Menka Sibdasani in the days to come and the years to come will get adequate attention of poets and critics, uh, because it was only in a few uh, anthologies that she has been included. Uh, but then there have been very beautiful comments about her poetic craft. Uh, Keki and uh, Darubala says, Menka Sibdashani's poetry is both original and striking. Though it appears to be unusual, not just her tangential way of putting things across, but also how thought process and imagination run away with the poem and make it exciting. An experience is translated into another experience and then gets mixed up with fancy in juice blender. Her poetry holds together a private world of chaotic emotions through its logical development and strikingly imaginative images, rightly has Bruce King said. And uh, K. B. Raghupati, one of uh, the famous uh, critics of the contemporary poetry says, uh, but what he says, uh, we can have a look at it, but this womanhood that she tries to seek is not easy to get only a series of experiences that only harden, just as carbon is subjected to various processes to make what can be called a diamond, but also awaken the inner to the realities in the mundane world. My dear friends, in this mundane world, poetry actually requires listeners, poetry requires people who could lend their voices to it, poetry requires patient ears. Poetry requires patient thoughts because unless and until we give patient thoughts to a poem, we cannot enjoy, we cannot extract the joys of a poem. So, having discussed some of the poetic uh, gems of Menka Sibdashani, the time has come now to wind up, but it would not be a better way to wind up this talk by taking some lines from Main Kasib Dashani is one of uh, the poems and atheist's confessions where she says, I look at the sculptures in the puja room and wonder, are the gods faintly beginning to smile again? This is a world where our traditions say that God exists. But if God exists, why there are incidents which we do not approve of. If God exists, how can there be cruelties coming to us, ruining us in various forms, in various manifestations? Are we not living in a world where God has also become a mute spectator, but then God should at times or the other smile, even though faintly, violently, subtly, and with this, let us come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.